Put simply, training your tendons is one of the single most important aspects of your training that you're probably not putting enough emphasis on. Having stronger tendons not only protects you against injury, not only helps you to combat and reduce pain that you might be experiencing, it can also help you to unlock your true athleticism because tendons are capable of far greater force output than is muscle. If you're only training your muscle, you're leaving a huge amount of performance on the table, whether you're an athlete, whether you're a lifter, or whether you're just a physical culturist. My previous video on tendon training is one of my most successful. However, that video is also four years old now. While it mostly holds up, I've learned an awful lot since then, through study, through personal experience, and through conversations I've had with some truly amazing experts in their fields. And with tendon training being so incredibly important, I felt it was crucial to share them with you. It was time for a redux. So welcome to my new comprehensive guide to tendon training for 2023 and beyond. If I'm gonna do this right though, if I'm gonna make this a truly comprehensive guide to tendon training, then I need to speak to a true expert and I happen to know just the guy. So why is training the tendon so important? Well, simply put, muscle doesn't work in a vacuum. Whenever you place the muscle under strain, you're also placing the tendons under strain. It helps to think not just in terms of muscles, but in terms of MTUs or muscle tendon units. In fact, it makes even more sense to think about muscles in the context of the broader system, how they relate to other muscles in the body and the rest of your connective tissue, like the fascia. If you want to get the maximum performance, then you need to be training in specific ways to strengthen this connective tissue because simply curling weights isn't going to do it. Lifting weights will improve your tendon strength to a degree, but it's very limited compared with specifically targeting those things. And because so few people actively train their tendons, this is actually a kind of untapped well. It's kind of a, a frontier of performance that you can tap into and then outperform your peers or competitors. There's a great video from Keegan Smith, the ATG coach on this topic. He discusses how someone like Stefan Holm is able to generate incredible power despite not having big, bulky, strong legs. And he does this by using his tendon. Stephen Holm can legitimately leap over your head probably like a ninja. Another example he uses are breakdancers who can do these incredible things that once again aren't possible because of their muscle strength, but rather because of their tendon strength. But for a lot of people, this is a moot point. They're nowhere near the point where they're able to perform breakdancing moves and instead they just want to focus on moving healthily and pain-free. A lot of joint complaints come down to problems with tendons and because we aren't stimulating the tendons properly through our daily lives or through our training, our muscles tend to outpace the tendons and this can lead to injury. And many people think this is a life sentence. They think their bad knee or their bad back is something that they simply can't reverse. However, we've seen plenty of examples that demonstrate this isn't the case. You can train and heal your tendons if you go about it in the right way. And this might be the secret to longevity and undoing a lot of that damage and starting to regain normal, healthy movement. In this video, I was fortunate enough to be joined by a true expert and trailblazer in this field, Ben Patrick, AKA knees over toes guy. So yeah. it's actually finding those points of, of pressure which is where we can potentially stimulate the tendon to grow. First, we need to build that base of strength and resilience. As I've discussed many times before, a new lifter will start to see structural changes to their muscle in as little as eight days. Conversely, it typically takes around two months for the same thing to occur in the tendons. This is largely due to lower blood supply to the tendons as compared with the muscles. The lack of blood vessels that travel through the tendons is partly what makes them so strong. However, it also makes them much slower to heal and grow. So if you're new to training and you start lifting very heavy weights, there's a high chance you may injure a tendon. And this is especially true if you're training using traditional lifts that utilize a short range of motion and largely don't target the tendons at all. My recommendation then has always been to promote blood flow to the muscles and tendons. And two great ways to accomplish this are through high volume training and high frequency training, using lighter weights and varied calisthenics movements. By moving often and in a wide variety of ways, we keep blood flowing to the tendons and keep them healthy. This is one reason that children are so supple and resistant to tendon injuries and muscle tears. So I'm a long way from Ben's level of knee strength and performance, but they are pretty strong and resilient and I'm able to do things that I know make some people cringe, like sissy squats or bunny hops. And the reason I think for this is partly just that I'm constantly training them throughout the day. I like to use what I call incidental training, as you guys know. So nearly every time I kneel down, which you do a lot when you've got kids, I do it like this. Kneeling. And then when I want to stand up, I go like this. In the gym, using large sets of light reps with continuous time under tension, sets of fast push-ups, curls, or leg extensions, for example, 
should cause the blood to travel to the muscles and pool there. Because the muscle is being constantly contracted, it doesn't have a chance to escape acting like a form of occlusion, or AKA blood flow restriction training. We see this when people tie tourniquets over their muscles. Over time, this can lead to permanently enhanced blood supply thanks to a phenomenon called angiogenesis, the birth of new blood vessels. We know that avascularity, a lack of blood supply, is associated with degenerative tendon disease, and the increased blood supply, triggered by the release of vascular endothelial growth factor, VEGF, is a critical part of the healing process. And it has also been shown that blood flow restriction training can enhance VEGF production versus regular training, along with general angiogenic gene expression. In other words, pump training builds blood vessels. And this is very logical. Continuous time and attention and occlusion training play significant demand on the tendon blood supply. The body responds by increasing that blood supply. Following such training, the body now has greater blood flow to the affected region, enabling more rapid recovery and lower instance of injury. Then you'll be ready for the next level of tendon training to unlock crazy performance gains. Once you know that your tendons could withstand some punishment, you can begin to train them directly. Lifting heavy weights will always place the tendons under force. However, the amount of force will always be limited as the muscles act like a kind of buffer. And because the tendons can handle greater force than the muscles, weight training alone is not enough to tap into their maximum potential, at least not traditional weight training that uses shorter ranges of motion. This is where we have to get creative. In the past, I've discussed using techniques such as heavy partials, moves like rack pulls, to place the tendons under greater load than you normally could. Heavy negatives can work in the same manner, letting you support more weight than you can lift. But there may be a much more efficient way to target the tendons, and this is where Knees Over Toes Guy really comes into his own. So another option is to use weighted stretching. Weighted stretching uses lighter weight, but takes you through a much greater range of motion than does regular training. And because the muscle reaches its maximum length, this means much more force is going to be transferred to the tendon. Weighted stretching can increase range of motion and mobility. It can help you to generate strength from a stretched position, such as the bottom of a squat for a far more massive jump height. And it can make you incredibly resilient against injury. And this is where the narrative around training has traditionally been all wrong. For decades now, the advice has been to avoid any movements that place strain on the tendons. And the most famous example, of course, is letting the knees pass the toes when squatting. The logic was that because letting the knees past the toes places pressure on the tendon, it increases the risk of injury. Did you know that doing bicep curls puts pressure on your biceps? So we should probably stop doing them right in case we hurt our biceps. And whilst we're at it, maybe we should just stop moving entirely. I think that'll probably be safer for everybody. That it was a study in 1978 that scared everyone away from knees over toes. Yeah. Only for it to be found later that training knee over toe returns athlete to sport faster, builds the tendon, yeah. only, to, only to still find that even a full range of motion squat, contrary to popular concern, actually makes you less likely to have any injury, strengthens your lower body. No one has done as much to champion the importance of tendon training as Ben and his team. Through his various programs, he's helped countless people to restore their knees and develop amazing athleticism. But his concepts don't just apply to the knees. The same ideas can be applied to the lats, the shoulders, the elbows, the back, the hips, you name it. Ben believes in training every angle at every range. Ben and the Athletic Truth Group have also done the most to codify this type of training, utilizing a combination of what they call short range and long range movements to effectively target the tendons at all positions. In short range movements, this is something like a pulse squat or a backwards sled pull, you utilize high repetitions and lighter weights to get the blood flowing to the tendons, just as we discussed earlier. So short range training is particularly advantageous to getting a lot of circulation and a lot yeah. of blood flow. Then something like dragging a sled backward for 10 minutes straight has quite literally got thousands of people off painkillers for the knee, but that is not how you bulletproof your knees. It, mm -hmm. it is it is building to the fullest range, the fullest quote unquote pressure that you can yeah. take a joint. That is actually how you make it more resilient. So it's understanding that any exercise is on a scale of range of motion, doing a reverse step up. That's another one that you can scale to really, really easy levels. So compared to just don't let your knee over your toe versus finding a short range of motion with the knee over the toe, mm -hmm. building up strength. Yeah. Now you start to find that some of those longer range exercises all of a sudden don't hurt as much. 
These movements actually minimize the load on the tendons and can be used to move those areas safely while also building strength and neural drive in preparation for what comes next. But long range movements are the real secret source. These act like those weighted stretches, placing the tendons under greater load than can otherwise be accomplished. These include things like the ATG split squat, like the seated good morning, and anything else that puts you in that real stretch position whilst under load. And while these movements might look a bit scary, they should be treated like any other advanced movement. Build up to them. Don't dive straight in. Don't train through pain. Listen to your body. Take your time and these are not only safe, but crucially important for long-term health and performance. So this can be a little bit tricky to visualize, so I thought I'd create a little bit of a learning aid and I made this. Basically what this is, is it's two pieces of elastic tied to a piece of string and here the elastic is meant to represent the tendons and the string is supposed to represent the muscle. Now obviously the tendons are actually harder than the muscles, so in that sense this doesn't quite make sense, but what we're going to be doing is keeping slack in the string and that's supposed to represent the the muscle in a shortened state and then when it lengthens it goes straight like that. If you use these extremer ranges of motion, if you use a, a long range movement, then suddenly the muscle can stretch no further and now that force is being transferred to the tendons on either end. Like what I treaded as my favorite exercise, the ass to grass split squat. And I use, to show how simple it is, uh, I use a, a rubber wedge. Someone can get an industrial sized doorstop. So that's what I use. Oh, it's good so, so this is not some fancy invention. It's just, oh, it's, just a bigger, <laughs> it's just a bigger doorstop. Yeah. Um, so this, this elevates the heel so the ball of the foot is down. By assisting yourself, you can get just about anyone into this because we're talking about uh, less than the amount of strength needed to go down the stairs. You're turning going down the stairs and going back up the stairs backward. You're turning that into a precisely measurable strength exercise done for a higher number of repetitions over time. That's yeah. like your foundational short range knee exercise. Now imagine you have a twin. One of them avoids knees over toes. The other one builds up strength in that short range. You now have more muscle tissue. You have more tendon tissue. You're getting more circulation to heal old injuries. Now when you start to progress into a full range of motion split squat, there's less chance of pain. There's more strength there. And then there's still another range though. All right. Uh, there's still one more range, which is outer range. Outer, so, yeah. so something like a sissy squat that the yeah. most bulletproof of the bulletproof of knees can do, that's really getting into an outer range. It's not just a long range. Like when you do a full range of motion squat or split squat, you hit a resting point, like it stops. Yeah. That's a long range, it stops. But when you do a sissy squat, it doesn't really stop. It actually is almost like you're at like the limit of like stretch that can occur. That's an yeah. outer range. And there are other ways to overload the tendons too. For example, plyometric or shock training could be a powerful tool. For example, if you land from a box jump of 42 inches, you'll be absorbing a shock equal to roughly three to four times your body weight. This is far more than most people can squat. And it's not the muscle that handles this force, it's the tendons. So what's key here is the amortization phase of the movement, the little pause at the bottom where the direction is reversed. This is where you absorb that energy and return it. Even just loading a heavy weight onto your back and bouncing at the bottom of a squat can create increased momentary force to challenge the tendons. Another option is isometric training. This means training without moving, holding a weight in position or pushing and pulling against an immovable object. In these cases, because the muscle is not lengthening or shortening, more force is once again transferred to the tendons. This makes extreme isometrics a powerful tool for training tendons and increasing blood flow in perhaps an even more targeted manner than the aforementioned pump training. An extreme isometric is just a normal yielding isometric held for a really long period of time, like upwards of several minutes sometimes. A great example would be something like the horse stance, which is perfect for training the tendons. Indeed, a large focus of Shaolin training was originally to strengthen the sinew. Quasi-isometrics, meanwhile, or extremely slow reps of challenging movements can also be effective to this end. Meanwhile, you can use overcoming isometrics. We push or pull against a completely immovable force for around six seconds to build significantly greater tendon strength. Or ballistic isometrics, where you perform isometrics but with explosive intent. And if you want to see a visceral example of how this can lead to tendon remodeling and growth, just look at the hands of any rock climber that has been training for a few years. They'll typically have huge hands and thick fingers as a result of hanging from the fingers, stretching them, exploding from them, and using them on a nearly daily basis. 
It's also really important that you support this by likewise putting the effort in outside of the gym with the right lifestyle and with the right diet and nutrition and supplementation. Of course, you wanna cover the basics. Sleep can go an awfully long way. Likewise, you wanna avoid things like smoking. Studies show that smoking can impair tendon healing. And then you wanna eat a balanced and nutritious diet, including lots of protein, lots of minerals, and in particular, lots of collagen. There are plenty of studies now demonstrating collagen's usefulness in not only restoring normal health, to tendons and encouraging repair and recovery, even turning back the clock, but also how it can actually improve athleticism, perhaps improving jump height and running speed. I'm not gonna go into this in much more detail because it's not my area of interest, but suffice to say that if, like I say, you're putting in the work in the gym, you need to make sure you're eating right, recovering right, and just treating your body well outside of the gym as well. So there you go guys, that was a pretty much comprehensive introduction to tendon training. There is definitely more to say on this topic. It's a massive topic, just like muscle. For example, I'd love to go into detail in future about how tendons make you move more efficiently by allowing you to return energy when walking, for example, so that you hardly need to contract your muscles at all. I'd like to talk about the relationship between flexibility and tendon stiffness for athleticism. I'd like to talk about the relationship between tendons and fascia. These are topics I'll likely be covering in the coming months. So if that sounds interesting, then please subscribe. I'd like to take this moment to say a massive thank you to Ben Patrick, Knees Over Toes guy, for appearing in this video and being so generous with his time. I've been a massive fan of Ben's for an awfully long time. I constantly reference his moves and ideas in these videos, so it was only a matter of time before I got him on the channel. If you have any knee pain or any other joint pain, then I highly recommend checking out his stuff. I'll leave links to that in the description down below. I will be sharing the full conversation with him in the coming days, so stay tuned for that as well. Alternatively, if you're looking for a training program that covers a broad spectrum of different training styles and combines them in one place, combining things like kettlebell training, weightlifting, calisthenics, all into a single program that does also include a lot of weighted stretches and mobility work, then check out my ebook and training program, Super Functional Training 2.0, The Protein Performance System. A huge thank you as well to Paul and Louise for not only letting me film at their gym, first for Fitness and Bista, which is fantastic and you should check it out if you're local, but also to Paul for demonstrating some movements. They even let me bring my massive plyo box and take up loads of space that way. And a massive thank you to Anytime Fitness and Bista for also letting me film there. I think that's all the thanks out of the way. Oh yeah, thanks to you guys so much for watching this one and I'll catch you next time. Bye for now.